history of that. Well, and so we'll spend that time. This will basically be the thing um, we're going to. First of all, just what are the issues about food production today, and especially as we think about what's happening in, in the future, actually happening today, and this thing sort of will change as we go into the future. Um, and then we'll go through just basically a very <laughs> high level what, history of agriculture from thousands of years ago to today. Get three or four slides. So that's a real brief history. Uh, I will talk about then what we call more modern egg technology, which will be mostly about uh, the GMO area. Though when I talk about modern egg technology, You've already heard mention, and you probably heard of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. Um, actually, the first things that you'll see in the marketplace will, that are based on that gene editing will probably be in the egg tech. I won't really talk much about that, um, but when we get to the GMO part, I'll just I'll highlight um, a bit of what gene editing is about, at least in regards to uh, plants. Um, after that, then, I'll talk about you know regulatory approval. So if you create these GMO you know, crops, you know, what are they the testing actually is doing? Like how much? Because then there's definitely a lot of confusion out there. And you hear things from uh, oh they don't test these things whatsoever. Who's heard that? Like GMO crops. Yep, they don't test these things. Okay. So um, I'll show you what we, what is done. Um, my background is about chemistry before coming to KGI. I spent 25 years in this industry, so um, I know a thing or two about it. It's one that I'm very passionate and excited about because I think and I know that we need pretty much all the technologies that are available. And I'm not talking just about GMOs. I'm talking about digital A and other things that are happening today um, in order to feed the world and move to uh, 2050. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that soon. So lastly, I really want to leave time, be it at the end, but please interrupt me at any, any time to ask questions about that. Because again, we hear so much about plant GMOs that um, I, I really invite you to your, your questions. And any of them are absolutely fine. You know, anything from, oh, I hear they poison us. <laughs> it's absolutely fine to ask. And then we'll, we'll go through that. Because that's the only way we really learn is through a discussion. OK. So let's start off by talking about what's going on. I think we've all heard about this. But by 2050, there's going to be 2 billion more people around here. That's a lot of people. Today, I'll show you the next slide. We're around 7.7 .7 billion. So we're going to have 2 more billion people to feed. But we've got to figure out how we're going to do that. Okay. We've come a long way in technology, and I'm going to show you some of those, but it's not enough. We can't just stop with what we've done today and be able to say, good enough, that, this will cover it. Because there's a lot of issues about trying to feed that many people as of today. And so that leads to why do we need to increase agricultural production? And as I was saying, one of this is because we've got a rising population. This is a little bit old only by a couple years, because it says today we're at 7.1 billion. Actually, I just checked today. You can go on, and what's, what's the human population counter? And it shows you as there, people are, are increasing. We're at 7.7 .7 billion globally. Okay? So, out of date. And they're projecting it's going to be about 9 point something uh, billion, 9 and a half, whatever. Okay, so that's, you already mentioned, that's, that's a big deal. Here's the other thing that's, that's tough about it, is that we're not going to actually have more land to, to grow things. And in fact, we don't want to take up more land. It's, that's contributing to problems that we use more rainforests and other areas to, to grow more crops. That's, that's a negative thing to do. And just to show you how that's changed, you can see there, so in the early 60s, it's, on average, you had an acre per person for growing food. And then by 2050, we only can get a third of that. Okay. Well, the good news is that we made a lot of progress on that, though, but as I'm telling you, we can't stop now. Okay. Climate change is a huge, huge factor in how um, we're going to deal with the effects of climate change on our ability to feed the world are, um, are very challenging. And I'll talk 
little bit about that in the next slide. So we have to deal with that. And then the one of the things that's just happening <coughs> with uh, developing countries, a number of them now becoming, uh, call it more wealthy, whatever, diets are changing. Uh, in particular, if we look at China, more meat is being consumed than it was before. And that also means we're going to need more grain to be able to, to feed the chickens or the pigs or whatever it is that, uh, that are being consumed in the developed countries. So all those are the factors that are changing. What do we need to grow and how much do we need to grow to feed the world? So climate change, the impacts of that to growers are really across the whole spectrum the challenges that they have. First of all, planting zones will be changing. So what could be grown, or couldn't be grown, say, where I grew up in Minnesota, in the northern part, that's shifting. And so now things there, or in Canada, could be grown before, could be. And that sounds like you know, maybe that's a positive. Um, but there's more areas where the challenges of that change and that shift is, is making it harder. And that's because of factors like extreme weather, um, more insects are going to be expanding. So the pests that attack our crops are expanding. Um, weeds are becoming more and more of a problem, um, as well as disease. And lastly, as we all feel in California, water availability is becoming more and more of a challenge. Okay. All of these have to be approached with, with newer technologies, more, beyond just the plant biology, but things in how we manage water and uh, deal with that fairly that both so that we can drink but also grow the crops uh, are huge challenges. So that gives you the background in terms of our challenges. Let's just talk a bit about agriculture from the history. Remember, three slides in 4,000 years. Okay? So, okay, if we look first just back, just even a little over 100 years, and what, what did agriculture represent that? I mean, it's like, it was very labor intensive. The amount of crops that we could grow in terms of the yield was much less than what it is today. We had lots of farms. They were very, very small, um, single digit acre type farms. And importantly, greater than 40% of the workforce in the United States were involved in agriculture directly. Okay, when we look to today, and it's, it's a much different picture. So one, things have gotten highly productive, very mechanized when you think of you know, the invention of tractors, combines, but now an inclusion of, of uh, things to survey what's going on in the crops. And farmers being able to make decisions about what needs to go to where if I have a problem with this bit of pest based on something that they're able to see and is digitized and downloaded as well. Um, farms definitely are fewer and much larger. Yeah. How long have they been using the drones in farms? Um, it's, I would say um, within the last five years. Yeah. And it's continuing to grow significantly. And besides just drones, other things that are up monitoring what's going on in the field. Um, I spent a lot of time at UC Riverside, and one of the adventures that I'm working with there is actually been able to monitor insects in the field based on the frequency of the flight. It's really cool stuff. So they they know, you know, is that a bee in there? Is that is that you know something which is we want to have there, or is that a moth which produces a caterpillar which eats the crop and something that we don't want in there? So these are the kind of mechanized technologies that are just exploding right now. Yes. <clears throat> uh, you know, the, the fall in the workforce, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. Um, is the number of workers per acre changed? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, oh, population has grown. Oh, abs absolutely. It has uh, A lot because of mechanized. And of course, we think a lot of our produce crops are still, um, there's, there's a fair amount of infield workers for that. But the challenge there, of course, is that there's not enough. And one of the pushes to mechanize a lot of what's going on in agriculture is that we just don't have the labor force in the country to be able to manage, even currently, with all the work that has to occur in order to the field. 
Um, and I'm actually glad you asked that because this, this is one of the issues I think we all have with agriculture is because now I mean, there's less than 2% of us that have any experience or any knowledge about the farm that makes it more distance. We really don't understand you know, what's, what's going on in the farm. Versus, you know, 1900, 40% of the population were involved in agriculture. There's a lot more knowledge of what was happening there directly. So, here's the history. Do you want it? Have you ever seen what corn actually looked like That's in the wild? <laughs> in the um, Central America is, is where uh, maize started out, and it was called Tisente, but that's what it's called today. And as you can see, it looks a heck of a lot different from there, say about 4,000, 5,000 years ago, to what it is today. And you can see, you know, kind of this, this maybe 2,500 years shift from one to the other there. So this is the ancient form of biotechnology, and I'm not kidding when I say that. What we did as a human race to be able to get from there to there is we made selections. We saw something that, this is what I like in the crop, so I'm going to plant that seed again, and I'm selecting for that thing that I desire. That's really what breeding, plant breeding is all about, is the selection to be able to get finally uh, this, to you know, something that looks like modern maize. So that has occurred over those thousands of years as a natural breeding thing, but we as human beings made that happen. Okay. So what do we see today? Um, there's lots of what we call, we call natural occurring mutations. That's how we define what were red grapes versus white grapes. Okay. So how we got our Chardonnay was based on some selection that said, hey, I wonder if we can do something better with white grapes than with red grapes. Okay. And that was another, over time, natural mutation. And what growers did is they selected for that. And that's how we have white and, and red grapes. If we look at what we're eating today, and if you look within a particular crop, and you can see the genetic diversity is huge. Okay, in a sense, it's surprising. Red peppers, green peppers, you know, uh, granny apples, red delicious apples. These are all genetic diversity that we eat every day. Now, some of these, rather than what we call natural mutations, a number of the things that we eat actually were created. I would say starting around in the 50s uh, until you currently today through chemical or UV radiation, mutagenesis. So sometimes the time that it takes to finally observe something in a crop and say, I want that, is just, frankly, it's too slow. And so what was done before, I call more modern biotechnology, the, the initial biotechnology that occurred actually in the laboratory in a test tube in the plate where you had uh, say seeds or whatever source of the plant tissue might be and you aerated it or you subjected it to chemical mutagenesis. That sounds a little scary. About 3,000 different varieties of food that we eat today created through that type of mutagenesis. So how we like red grape That was created through mutagenesis that the laboratory. If you're not, if you don't have celiac disease, how many people eat wheat or wheat products? Almost all varieties of wheat and rice were created or enhanced in terms of their traits using mutagenesis of some sort or the other. A lot of times, a lot of times, people don't know that. Okay. Now, are they safe? Yeah, we've been eating them for you know, a long time, uh, so it would appear that they're safe. And the question is, you know, the changes that you made, say by mutagenesis or other means, um, even traditional reading is what is the intended change, and then what is the result of that change besides just the intended ones. And that's where we can talk about original notes. 
Well, we may say some of these technologies sound you know, a bit scary, but if we look now in the history, say within the last 200 years, what's happened in terms of our ability uh, to increase yield, which obviously are necessary to uh, feed a growing population. And this graph is just on maize. You could just probably take about any modern crop and you'll have an identical one, the years might change. But what I find really interesting is if you notice from about 1860 to just like almost 1940, there was no change in the yield of corn. I mean, for 80 years, we made no improvements whatsoever. And that I find it's like, what, how could that be? And that obviously, if that hadn't changed, we'd been, been in big trouble to this day. Well, the first kind of change occurred right here, and that's where hybrid corn came into being. The, I mean, hybrid corn is, you know, is that, what does that mean? Does anyone, can anyone tell me about hybrid corn? So hybrid corn is where you get, you actually cross one parent with another. It's just you know, a simple thing. You have two parents and creates a sibling. The fact that you make it hybrid creates what we call hybrid vigor, which this is done in wheat, this is done you know, with corn, with rice to wheat. It produces, call it the offspring, that are more abundant in terms of the yield and then hardiness. It's, it's a hybrid. You do a cross between two different parental lines, and that hybrid seed yields better than if you had, well, just a, uh, an inbred seed, for, for lack of a better term. Yeah. So those hybrids, mm -hmm. um, when, you, when you cross those two do a hybrid corn, if that's what you have to use fewer pesticides for because you grow it to resist pests, is that included in the hybrid? It, it, it can be included in the hybrid, but something there's within the hybrid, and it's fairly complex genetically, but it's, it actually is literally called uh, hybrid vigor. So that cross, that hybrid seed, will yield more than just either, either of those parents by themselves. So it's more on yield than yeah. Okay. Yep. So that really, that was the first thing. This is, but if you look at what's bred there, that was the introduction of nitrogen fertilizers, pesticides, uh, mechanization, tractors and combines, um, and actually plant geneticists working really hard to improve the genetics. So today, for example, one of the reasons we can get so much more corn out, out of the field is breeders have genetically improved it so that you can grow more corn closer together and can grow taller and produce more years. And that was a lot of just kind of that old traditional selection and breeding. Uh, now there's no doubt that improvement that we see from nitrogen fertilizers and pesticides, there's no doubt that also had some negative effects. Here's where we have to ask ourselves as a society, do we feed the world or do we deal with this? Or are there solutions that can, can really help be more sustainable as well as to be able to move across. Well, speaking of sustainability, um, corn is a product that doesn't have a lot of nutrition product. Is there GMOs that are being targeted specifically for corn to create a more nutritional product? Um, not, I mean, like in a quality, quality sense, not so much directly with corn, other than they, there has been work uh, done, say, to improve the oil composition or the protein composition. Um, you're right in the fact that, that, that corn um, isn't the fully nutritious in which you get. For example, it's fairly low in livestock. So corn, which is fed to um, livestock, has to be supplemented with glycine. So actually, some of the things that I was involved in is actually looking at enhancing the glycine content with the corn so that it wouldn't have to be supplemental. But today, what, what people do when say pigs are, are feeding corn, it's, it's very high energy, high in carbohydrate, has a certain amount of oil and protein. But usually they're mixing, not usually, they have to mix the corn with other supplemental feed so that, say, a pig gets the full nutrition So there have been some efforts in that area. Yes? Um, 
So you're talking about feeding livestock. What, like, what percentage of the corn that is being grown goes to livestock versus people? Directly? Directly. Um, the number I will say here is not quite accurate, but it's qualitatively right, about 80% of the corn. Well, let me take yeah. So 90% of the corn we grow is going either to livestock or to make up them. Okay. And let's, so that, of that 90%, probably a third of that is going to uh, energy production, or ethanol production. Of course, mostly in the Midwest. The rest is being raised for livestock. Um, of that, because the amount of corn that we grow, and this is really important for farmers right now, most of that is exported. And China is one of the major import countries, which current situation with tariffs and all that, it's, just, it's been hitting the farmers really hard, both for, um, for corn as well as soybeans. Because they're major export products besides uh, feed. Like that. The last thing I want to point out in the graph is what's in green, and that's the time that um, egg biotech has been, um, has been around, which started in about the mid-90s. Um, actually, the very first biotech crop was something called flavor saver tomato. Has anyone heard that? Heard that? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's, it's really cool. It was out there. Can you buy it today? No, it's not there. And really, the main reason for it is not because it was banned. This was, it was long before all of these came up there. Uh, the reason, bottom line, is it didn't perform in a way that consumers really felt the value was there. And so. These products work like everything else does by market forces. Nevertheless, the GMOs have helped us a lot in terms of advancing a number of technologies, increase, continue to increase the growth of our yield. Um, on top of that, we, yes, we continue to make genetic improvements, but the ag biotech traits have also been able to increase yield, be it in corn, but also in other crops that we do. If you can read it, some of the highlights there. So this is somewhat controversial, but in particular it's true if you look at insect protected crops, we use fewer pesticides. Insect protected crops, uh, essentially what they do is they, a gene has been inserted which the corn expresses, which is very specific to killing pests that eat the crop. It ends up it's the same protein that's, that organic farmers use as to as a, basically a spray over on top of those. This works a lot better, but it's the same active ingredient. And so in those crops, particularly corn and cotton, but others that have an insect protection trait in there, um, use far less amount of insecticide than what we have to do, than what is done in other crops. So how many people like sweet corn? Okay. Summer's here. It's, it's, it is the thing of summer to eat sweet corn. About no less than 20% of the sweet corn market actually is GMO. And the trade is insect protection. But because of public weariness, it's, it's only 20%. It probably won't grow. It might even shrink. Just so you know, sweet corn is probably one of the most intensive insecticide use crop that's out there. I mean, who likes to open up a ear of corn and find you know, a worm in there that's eat, eating away at your, your corn? You don't want that. I mean, none of us want that. And so the conventional non-GMO sweet corn, um, to get that, they use lots of insecticides to do that. Now, that's not inferring it's unsafe to eat, because I feel perfectly fine eating a ear of corn. Okay? And we'll talk a little bit about the safety um, most of these anyway. But just so you know, if you happen to actually see, you probably never see it's like it's actually this GMO sweet corn. If you're worried about insecticide, you might want to go for the GMO one versus the not. Okay, so enough of the data. A quiz. What's the name of the famous plant biologist who won the Nobel Peace Prize and is estimated to have saved a billion? I'm not kidding, a billion lives through his technical innovations and humanitarian efforts. And in the back row, if you know it, don't, don't say it. You would have did. Okay, well, let's do that. Can any, any, and this is okay, this is a typical non-answer. 
can anyone mention who is that person? Who is the person? Choices. <laughs> choices, 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 <laughs> choices. choices. Yeah. <laughs> First name starts with, and I'm no animesh, no. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Shut down. Starts with the what? Yeah. Oh, first name starts with an M. Last name starts with an E. Nathaniel. Okay. Well, who's, no, this is not the person. Who's heard of Jonas Salk? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. What did Jonas Salk do? Oh, yeah. Pretty big deal. Okay. But he didn't. I mean, you put it on a scale. He didn't save a billion lives. This is part of our problem with us not really knowing all of the innovation that's going on, you know, with egg technology. So, his name is Norman Borlaug. Now, has anyone heard that name before? No. No. Okay. A humanitarian of, of unmeasurable level. Um, and I'll tell you, science-wise, what he did, but the Green Revolution, the shirt for the 60s, Norman was coined as the father of the Green Revolution. What he did is he worked in developing countries that at that time, Mexico and Central America, almost all was a developing country, where food issues were really huge when it came into the 50s and the 60s. They knew they weren't going to be able to feed the whole population. And so what Norman did is he worked in meat fields, that's where he started, to make hybrid wheat also to select wheat that was more adaptable to where it was being grown, more resistant to disease, such that the yields in these developing countries started in Mexico, then went into India, and uh, Pakistan, and other areas, probably increased fivefold. Um, so that's, that's a pretty big deal. What they really credit Norman is not only doing that, but he was, um, he pushed for adoption of these newer technologies in these countries that just as what we're seeing in GMO today, believe it or not, people were saying, hybrid corn, hybrid wheat, that's not natural. I don't, that doesn't sound like it would be good. So things as simple as creating these hybrid crops uh, were, there was a lot of resistance there. So what Norman did is he just was tireless, his effort to make sure that these things were integrated. Okay. Uh, he died about five or so years ago. It was in his, his late 90s. Um, but until you know the day he died, he was always he was pushing on new technologies to the doctor so that he overlooked. Now it's it is amazing when he said he has been he saved more lives than any other person who has ever lived. So now I'm going to ask you, Norman Borlaug? I didn't know exactly who it is. He was right there with Jordan Salter and all the other heroes that are out there. Okay, so let's just talk about a little bit now about the silence. It won't be very heavy or that much. Um, at first, we haven't seen a slide yet, but everyone's kind of heard of uh, you know genes. We all have genes. And we, we go from genes to with DNA to RNA, and that finally makes proteins in the end. And we don't need to talk about you know, all that process there, but to have some perspective. So the human genome is about 3.2 megabases. Is that right, Anamesh? Uh, human genome is yeah, uh, se se seven point uh, megabase. Uh, yeah, seven point three. Is it really something? Okay. Times no, 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 three no, point, three yeah, you're right. Three point four okay. and ten. So what's a megabase? Yeah, it's so if it's, you look at this yeah. picture here, you probably can't see it that much, but on the yeah, DNA. It's a haploid is three point five, so seven yeah. uh deploid. Yeah. Okay. So um, what we're showing is just a picture of a snippet of DNA. Each one of those represents one base, and those are base pairs. You go from the top to the bottom. And you've kind of heard about those things before. So that's just a short piece. When we talk about a mega base, we're talking about a million of those base pairs. Okay? And so the human genome is 3.2 mega bases, so it's 3.2 million you know, of those base pairs. Um, and that produces 
roughly, in terms of the number of proteins, roughly around 20,000. Which, that sounds impressive. So maize, don't be impressed, that can go number right. Um, 15.8 megabases, okay, so five times larger than the human genome. And produces, you know, around 42,000 proteins. So next time when you look at corn, you should be impressed because they're more complex than you. Okay. Sad thing is, is our genome is not that much more complicated than the fruit fly or around it. Sorry, <laughs> it's it's the truth. Okay. So that's just perspective of plants. Almost all plants have more more complicated genome uh, than new humans. And if you think about it, you know, what do plants do that we don't? One, they have photosynthesis, they have chloroplasts. You know, they can take CO2 and actually make carbohydrates out of that. We, we can't do that. That's why plants are really important when it comes to greenhouse gases. Okay, so very simple explanation of what we're talking about crop biotechnology, and we'll start original biotechnology to traditional breeding. So if we look at this, this imagine these as genes in here. And if the plant on the left is, um, let's say, a wild type tomato, what I call a wild variety of tomato, actually is edible. It can be poisonous if taken by too much. But if that particular wild type tomato had great resistance to disease, what breeders might do is take that, cross that with a domesticated tomato, and then look for that disease trait. Now the problem is you get all the other stuff from that wild type um, tomato into that first cross. So breeders have to spend a lot of time getting rid of what I call the junk or the things that wouldn't be healthy for us to eat. But they're always screening for that disease trait. And in the end, what they have is something with the new domesticated tomato variety that has disease control, but it will have actually still a, lot, a number of genes from that wild variety that through the screening never left because they could never see or find anything that was negative about that. Okay. When we do a GMO trade, we would look at that same, what is the gene that is helping in that disease protection? And isolate that and you just take that gene only and put that into the tomato farm. So rather than taking that wild type and thousands of genes coming over, you're just taking that very single gene that has that trait and putting it into the, the new tomato farm. Okay? So it's, it's a much shorter process. It's much more precise in that sense. So we're only dealing with that gene that we know that has that particular trait. Does that all make sense? Yeah. So, <clears throat> plant biotechnology, how long is this industry? How long has it been around? Yeah. Um, so the first commercial uh, biotech trace that I mentioned came out in the mid-90s. Yeah. And um, the inventions actually first started in early 80s. Okay. So it tells you how long it took to actually get the first ones out there. But that's when companies, not just Monsanto, but the company that, that invented the flavor saver tomato is a company out of Davis, which is called Calgy. I actually ran that site for <laughs> six years, long after the flavor saver tomato. Is there a follow-up question? Have you sequenced the whole genome before? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, not me personally. Well, no. <laughs> you know, in my spare time. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, the most important economical crops, uh, most of them have full genome sequence. Okay. Now, of all the genes that are there, probably less than 5% of those can be studied in detail. So there's, it's one thing to have the genes to identify them, it's not to really know uh, function all of what they're doing. Okay? So, how is this actually done is actually we use nature's what I call it, nature's little plant transformer. And it's an agrobacterium. It's actually a bacteria that causes a disease in plants. Um, and you, many of you have probably seen this. If you're on a walk, you might see some old trees. You see that little kind of, we call it a gall. 
Okay, it's called Crow, crown gall disease. Okay, so it's a picture of a tree on the left. On the right, it's actually a blow up of a grapevine that has that same thing. So it's a disease that occurs naturally. Well, what the manifestation of that disease is part of the DNA which is in that bacteria actually gets inserted into the genome of the plant. Okay? And that then, it, you can say it, uh, it captures the plant's machinery for expressing those genes, and that enables the bacterium to multiply and grow. So part of bacterial DNA is actually inside of that plant gene. And what scientists did, and this started in the early 80s, uh, and this is it's a little too small, it's not too complicated. Um, ignore the part on, on the right part, but essentially what we've done with modern GMO technology is, is we've just deciphered what it is in that agrobacterium that does this amplification, inserts its DNA in there, We've hijacked that, disarmed it like you've heard when you've disarmed viruses and then all this so that it no longer really isn't in effects. But what we've done is we can take what's on top and see that little snippet, our gene of interest, we put that into what we call a transfer plasmid, which has all the machinery to then insert that our gene of interest into plant cells. And that's done in a test tube or in a petri dish. This isn't like a full-grown plant and infected that way. It's actually done in the lab, like I say, in a, in, in a small dish or in a test tube. And it's done with individual plant cells. Once that insertion is done, you can select for it. There's ways that you do it so that only those cells that have been transformed into the gene are the ones that are selected. And then while you have all these undifferentiated cells, what you do is then you feed those cells particular hormones and they turn themselves into a plant. Which is pretty magical in the end. But that's actually the process of making the gene go plant. Again, it's a very specific one gene to one place in the genome in the plant to get the trait that we're looking for. That kind of makes sense how that's done. That, um, by the way, was you know, probably 15 years of research to figure out how to do that. After they already knew that, that agrobacteria could do that on its own. So it was quite a bit of science that was there. Okay, so that's, there you go. You, now you know how GMO crops are made. Uh, before I jump into to, to that, are there any questions on that part? Okay, the last slides that I want to go through, we're just talking about, okay, if you've created these plants, what do we actually do to know that they're safe? Okay, what is the regulatory process? And what I'll start there is something you may be surprised. It takes longer to get a GMO crop through regulatory agencies and on the market than it takes a new drug. I'm going to get surprised by that. Yeah. Um, so right here in this graph, probably about three or four years old now, so it's actually longer, but it says about 13 years on average. I think the average now is probably about 15 years. From the discovery until introducing a product, whereas a new pharmaceutical is typically more on about a, a dozen years. And that's not a fast track one, but that's the typical pharmaceutical. So that's telling you there's a lot of work that obviously must be done if it takes that long to get something in the market. And so when we say how what is it, or what regulatory agencies actually look at these GMO crops to make sure that they're safe? Um, within the U.S. and all the counterparts globally, um, you know, there are three regulatory agencies that we have in the U.S. Um, and all three of them typically look at the GMO crops. Um, and they're looking at it for a particular reason. FDA, when they look at a GMO crop, they're, uh, they're saying, is this safe to eat? What's the data you have to provide to make sure that you know that it's safe to eat? The EPA is concerned if, for example, I've made an insect uh, protected uh, trait in tomato. So <laughs> that technically is a pesticide. So the EPA wants to be sure that that pesticide, the GMO crop, 
is now producing this safe to eat. Okay? And the USDA is concerned with those as well, but they're more on the environmental side. So if I create a new GMO crop, if I create a new super weed, or is it doing something which environmentally is going to be hazardous relative to the crop that wasn't uh, transformed? So those are the three agencies that you have to provide data for if you create a GMO crop before you know it's approved. And then how? What are the guidelines for that? And the very simple part is a reasonable certainty that no harm will result from outside of use made under or under the anticipated conditions of consumption. The thing about GMO crops or any technology is you say, how can we be 100% sure? The reality is, can we be 100% sure about anything? This actually is the approach that generate as much data as you can, both on your intended changes, your unintended changes, making sure that um, nutritionally we haven't changed things unless we've done it like increased light lysine and corn, that was an intended change that actually to be an improvement. So those are the things that you have to go through in order to get these things uh, commercialized. And I'm not going to go through this at all, but this, if, if you're interested later in how the slides will give, provide a little bit more detail about the many things that we do have to do uh, in analyzing the crop. One of the most important is if we have uh, plant that's producing a protein that wasn't there before, is that protein safe? And a big part of that definition, we absolutely have to make sure is, is it allergenic? And the last thing you want to do is to express a peanut protein inside of maize that happens to be the allergenic protein. You know, that's coming out of peanuts. That would be a very bad thing. So one of the things that's tested early on, in fact, it's way, it still is in the early discovery phase, is we look at a particular gene, a protein that produces, we run it against a database of known allergens, and if it pops up as as short as, short as seven amino acids, looks like it might be an allergen, it's gastrocyte. It never even gets into the discovery of the development phase. Regardless, even at the end, if it doesn't look like that, extensive studies are done to make sure that uh, that protein is not going to be an allergen. And that's just one example of some of the safety studies which, which are done. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's the end of my story. Um, any questions about what we'll talk about? And you can really go throw them all at me. Yeah. Uh, why is it then that the, there's so much public yeah. concern and outcry about GMOs? I mean, like Harry was saying, you see non gmo like, so yep. many packages. Like, what's the, do you know the genesis of that? Like, what the, what the yeah. thing is? Is there science behind it? Is it? Well, a lot of it, and I'll be part of the industry at that time, and I can take part of the blame, is um, lack of being up front and really educated what, what, what it's about. And, you know, frankly, it is, it's a lot easier to have a scary story than it is to say one about, you know, what, what we can do. So a lot of it is just knowledge that we failed to get out there, um, perhaps being a, um, you can call it naive, but maybe a bit arrogant as well. You just say, hey, it's about the science, so trust us. You know, that really doesn't work. <laughs> so that, I mean, at a high level, I think there's, there's a big part of that. I think the other is because a lot of the traits that initially came out there were ones that farmers really wanted. When you think about it, for a big biotech company, the farmer's the customer. So farmers wanted uh, greater yields and ease of their work. So herbicide tolerant trade is one of the big ones that's out there. As a consumer, it's like, that doesn't do anything for me. All I know is that you're putting more herbicide, or it may not be more, but you're putting a specific herbicide on top of the crop, I'd rather not have that at all. Well, weeds are a huge issue. If you don't use herbicides, then you have to go to things like no-till. I mean, you have to go to things like till the farm, which of course gets rid of uh, the topsoil as a big problem. Uh, one of the advantages of herbicide tolerant crops is you can go to a no-till um, scenario for farmers 
which uh, means you have much less soil erosion. It's actually one of the predominant things when you've heard about regenerative agriculture, recommendations, can you do things in a no-till? Uh, other technologies, such as cover crops, which are used now like with organic farmers and other areas, are another thing that uh, helps in that no-till situation. But I think that's one of the reasons, is consumers also saw, I don't see the benefit for me here. Can, can I just <clears throat> take that question and give a slightly broader political uh, view of that? And, and that is, um, in the previous 100 years, there was a transition from colonialism to more democracy throughout the world. Large companies such as you know, Monsanto and so, yeah. some places were equated in terms of colonial uh, or imperial imposition of uh, businesses, you know, large businesses onto smaller countries, mm -hmm. such as in Europe. So it became politically uh, expedient to link the two, the question of colonialism and the question of high technology user of individual farmers' livelihood in some way. So that was the, you know, everything that you said is absolutely correct in terms of the micro level uh, problems. You know, the, the companies that did it, uh, such as Monsanto or, you know, several other companies, were able to do it because they had the resources. Uh, but because they had the resources, they created the impression that they are imp imperialistic or colonial entities. And as a result, the two became. Uh, you know, merged into the same view of uh, colonial imposition on private enterprise. And that, unfortunately, is what happened, yeah. apart from everything that you said. Yes, yeah. so thank you, Tim. So I think all of us, I, I think of examples where I look at all these oil companies uh, as an example. And I think, you know, my first impression is, oh, they're, they're evil, <laughs> you know, or whatever. And, you know, certainly some things that have occurred or practices that have happened in particular companies, there's no doubt that it's like, that was a bad choice, you know, and, and uh, things came out of it. But having lived through the feedback, the reason Monsanto was the one that kept saving more than any of the major areas, because they're, they're the ones that were up in front and invented the technology and the first ones to introduce. It ends up on all the traits that are out there right now that are GMO traits, probably the 70, 75 percent of them originated from Montana. All the other big A companies were doing it, but they were behind. And so it's, you know, who's taking the lead? And that's the one that gets the, you know, the 